August of 1943, Allied leaders met in Quebec for a high-level war conference. Convinced that the war in Europe would be won within a year, the world leaders focused their attention on Japan. Roosevelt promised the Allies that he would deliver 200 B-29s by March of 44. Also during August of 1943, U.S. bombers taking off from North Africa hit the oil refineries of Ploesti in Romania. In Germany, the Allies had gained primarily because of massive bomber strikes against German industry. The onslaught of winter, along with the shortage of long-range fighter escort aircraft, severely reduced Allied air operations. During this lull, Germany continued to rebuild its lightly damaged industry with methodical efficiency. February 1944, the weather broke and the might of the U.S. Army Air Forces departed for Europe. Hundreds of bombers and fighters set out to destroy factories, aerodromes, and to take on the Luftwaffe in the air. This became known as the Big Week. It was, in fact, an invasion of German skies. In March, U.S. fighters and bombers reached Berlin for the first time, far into the interior of Germany. U.S. aircraft brought the war to the doorstep of the Reichstag. By this time, March 1944, U.S. forces in Italy had captured air bases from which American planes could more easily reach industrial and military targets in Austria, Czechoslovakia, and southern Germany. On the 5th of April, a force of 90 B-17s and 146 B-24s began the 600-mile run on the heavily defended oil refineries of Ploesti. Thus, the Army Air Force began the oil campaign. By May, American bombers and escorts were encountering heavy ground fire and smoke screens designed to obscure the targets. Enemy fighters outnumbered American fighters three to one. Destruction of the enemy fuel supplies would give the Allies a great advantage in the invasion battles to come. In England, Plymouth Harbor was an armed camp. Troops were massed for the assault on Europe. Eisenhower addressed the men with these words. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade towards which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. 5th of June, 1944. U.S. aircraft attacked coastal defenses and transportation and supply routes. They searched the sky for the Luftwaffe, but Germany had concentrated its air power to protect the homeland. Under cover of darkness, airborne troops landed in France behind the German fortifications. Reinforcements came in wooden gliders, the 20th century Trojan horses. While at sea, Allied armies prepared to hit the beach, facing high winds as they churned through rough seas. However, those landing early were lucky. For those who came over the following two weeks, encountered the roughest seas in the English Channel in 20 years. All along the Normandy coast, overwhelming waves of Allied troops poured into France, supported by 8,000 aircraft of the U.S. Army Air Forces and thousands of RAF aircraft. In support of the invasion, strategists devised a bold new plan of attack on the Romanian oil supplies at Ploesti. Dive bombing by P-38s. This reduced the disadvantage to precision bombing posed by the smoke screens. The steady aerial pounding whittled away 90% of Romanian oil production, and the death blow came to the German oil industry with the campaign against the German synthetic oil plants. In France, Allied ground forces came to a standstill after the capture of Cherbourg at the end of June. German counterattacks blocked them, and weather closed off air support. Finally, the weather broke, and the air attack resumed. One plane every two seconds, striking a target five miles long and one mile wide, cutting an opening through which General Patton 
would surge on his dash to Germany. Airstrikes forced an entire German division to surrender at Bougancy Bridge on September 16th. Again, the Germans replenished their fighter aircraft, largely from underground factories, but not their pilots. The air war over Germany was intense at times, but the momentum belonged to the Allies. Victory followed victory and led to the surrender by German leaders on May 7, 1945. In the Pacific, Army air forces engaged in island warfare and air attacks against Japanese ships. Island by island, ship by ship, U.S. forces worked their way back to the Philippines, itself a chain of 7,000 islands. After the Quebec Conference of 1943, the U.S. launched its strategic plan against Japan. Using Chinese labor, the United States built a string of bases in China in preparation for the B-29s then in production. In April of 1944, the new bombers arrived in India. In June, 68 of the giant craft took off to bomb an industrial target in Japan on the same day that Marines landed on Saipan. In the Pacific, Army air forces engaged in island warfare and air attacks against Japanese ships. Island by island, ship by ship, U.S. forces worked their way back to the Philippines, itself a chain of 7,000 islands. The most spectacular air action was the recapture of Corregidor on February 16, 1945. After intensive bombing, 50 C-47s brought 2,065 men to jump onto the narrow target surrounded by sheer cliffs. In early March, General MacArthur returned to say, hoist the colors and let no enemy ever haul them down. On Columbus Day 1944, the first of a fleet of B-29s landed on Saipan. Some Japanese officials recognized this as an early signal of their eventual defeat. From Saipan, it was a 3,000-mile round trip to Mount Fujiyama, 60 miles from Tokyo. The U.S. built its operations up to missions of 800 aircraft against Japan. Then a single plane attack against Hiroshima, followed by another three days later against Nagasaki, abruptly crushed any semblance of resistance which remained, and the war was over. Without being invaded, without losing a foot of homeland, Japan was defeated. The surrender came on August 14, 1945 with formal surrender ceremonies held aboard the USS Missouri, September 2nd. Russian-built MiGs operating in North Korea posed a dangerous new threat in the air. They were excellent fighter aircraft, but the pilots of the United States Air Force and U.S. Navy achieved a seven to one record over the MiGs due to superior flying skill and tactics. September 2nd, 1945 was a day of rejoicing for Americans. World War II had ended with the surrender of Japan. The formation of the United Nations gave false hope to many, a belief that peace had finally arrived to stay. Demobilization was rapid. Former soldiers, sailors, and Marines turned quickly to peaceful pursuits. An Army Air Force's B-29 was flown from Honolulu to Egypt non-stop, demonstrating intercontinental capability of strategic forces. 
In the United States, the aircraft industry was developing a giant airplane, the XB-36. Six piston engines developed 3,500 horsepower each. Four jets each provided 5,200 pounds of thrust. It had a range of 4,000 miles. The B-36 became a major U.S. weapon in the Cold War that was developing between the United States and Russia. The jet airplane was born in World War II, and in 1946, the P-80 set a new speed record from Long Beach to New York. Flight time, four hours, 13 minutes. In recognition of the importance of air power, national leaders designated the Army Air Forces as a separate service. The United States Air Force was born September 1947. The follow-on model to the P-80 started to roll off the assembly line. It was an aircraft destined to make a name for itself in later years, the F-86. Over the Mojave Desert, a B-29 full of recording instruments dropped a 5,000-pound airframe, the XS-1, from its Bombay mount. The aircraft carried 8,000 pounds of fuel, and Air Force pilot Captain Charles E. Yeager was the first man to fly faster than the speed of sound in level flight. In Berlin, the differences of opinion between the free world and the communist world blossomed into a very warm Cold War when Russians in East Germany decided to cut off two and one half million West Berliners from their food and fuel. The people and allied occupation forces in Berlin were faced with what appeared to be a decision to surrender or starve. The only way into Berlin was by air. The United States and Great Britain used this route to supply the isolated populace. For 15 months, 300 planes and 20,000 men were committed to Operation Vittles. Daily, they airlifted 4,500 tons of coal, sugar, coffee, flour, butter, milk, and other foods to Berlin. At the end of World War II, the Japanese occupation of Korea had ended. By agreement, the United States accepted the Japanese surrender south of the 38th parallel, and Russia accepted surrender north of the 38th parallel. North Korea immediately geared for war production. The South concentrated on industrial expansion to produce consumer goods. Thus, the South was unprepared when on the 25th of June 1950, a North Korean invasion force crossed the 38th parallel heading south. The North Koreans were apparently convinced that no nation would aid the South Koreans, but they were wrong. The United States sent a fleet of B-29s to Okinawa, within range of Korea, moved F-80s to southern Japan for immediate use across the narrow part of the dividing sea, and stationed F-51s at Daegu in southern South Korea. The immediate tactic was to mount airstrikes against North Korea, delaying that nation's efforts until ground troops could mass to repel the invaders. The United Nations committed member nations to assist South Korea. But the bulk of the job fell upon the U.S., and early fighting was from the air, as U.S. Air Forces went to work on enemy supplies, ammunition, and airplanes. Any aircraft for any job. Ground troops went to Korea in C-47s and C-54s. They celebrated the 4th of July, 1950, in a foreign land. The initial communist invasion drove Allied forces into a small area around Pusan in the southern part of South Korea. By August, U.S. and U.N. troops had dug in along the Pusan perimeter to buy time and keep a toehold on the Korean peninsula. F-51s provided a close air support. B-26s and B-29s flying from Japan attacked North Korean airfields giving the F-51s air superiority. Again, the U.S. had to gear up. Air crew training became a high priority. The need was for large numbers of pilots and navigators to fly troop and cargo transports that would be constantly flying between the U.S. and Korea. The U.S. needed crews for heavy and light bombers and fighter pilots to learn the skills of flying the new jet fighters that were coming off assembly lines. By September, military air transports and civilian contractors were flying 250,000 air miles a day.
With preparations complete, the UN offensive began. B-29s dropped thousands of bombs, destroying North Korean transport, supplies, and communications. Then, after heavy naval bombardment, General MacArthur directed an Allied invasion from the sea at Incheon. The offensive cut off the enemy between Incheon and the south. The forces at Pusan broke through. The combined air ground forces took another leapfrog jump in October. 3,000 paratroopers landed 30 miles north of the Korean capital of Pyongyang. Again, the U.S. shut off large North Korean units from their supplies. United Nations ground forces blitzed all the way to the Yalu River on the border of Manchuria. But at that point, the complexion of the war changed. China entered on the side of the north. Under massive attack, UN troops withdrew southward, consolidating their forces in the vicinity of the 38th parallel, the original border set up between the north and the south. Close air support of the UN withdrawal assumed vital importance. The Air Force was now facing a new enemy. Russian-built MiGs operating in North Korea posed a dangerous new threat in the air. They were excellent fighter aircraft, but the pilots of the United States Air Force and U.S. Navy achieved a 7-to-1 record over the MiGs due to superior flying skill and tactics. 39 Air Force pilots became aces. Final score would be 893 to 139. In mid-January 1951, UN forces attacked northward again. In mid-June, the North Koreans asked to go to the peace table. Truce talks began in July 1951, a little more than a year after the invasion by the North. It was to be the start of two long years of negotiations. All through this time, UN Air Forces continued to neutralize enemy activity with air assaults on their transportation, communication, airfields, and ground forces. Even before hostilities ended, the two combatants agreed to exchange prisoners. In April of 1953, the first of these, known as Little Switch, occurred. Some months later, Big Switch completed the agreement. Effective ground action, combined with the pressure of the UN air attacks against the North, convinced the North Koreans they couldn't win. they finally conceded. On July 27, 1953, the war ended. The United States Air Force played a vital role in holding the line against communist aggression.